And if you could please go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll get into the meat of your presentation. Yes, certainly. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name's Matthew, I'm the evangelist for Machinations. And today we're gonna to be diving in and talking about game economies and talking about the three core pillars that Machinations have been developing, uh, which kind of help understand and, and kind of solidify what we need to do to make sustainable Web3 economies. So hopefully if someone could just drop into the chat, if you're watching this live, that you, you can hear me and you can see me and uh, everything's working as it should be. Um, before I, I'll share my screen, anyone out there can just say, yes, it's working. That would be great. Also, if you guys want to add to, to the chat how awesome his background is, <laughs> I, I'm loving it. Good. I'm pleased. Good. People can see and hear me. I'm super pleased. Right. Let me jump into it. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start getting into this topic. Um, hopefully you can all now see my screen. Uh, so. This is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the core pillars. Uh, at Machinations, we've been developing these over the period of kind of the past kind of 12 months. Machinations have been around for about four or five years in its current existence. Um, and one of the things that we've always been doing is kind of focusing on um, game design, game economy design, and progression systems. That's what the core of the Machinations platform is all about. Uh, over the past kind of nine to 12 months, we've been really looking at kind of Web3 game economies and chasing this beautiful word of sustainability. And it's really easy to say that we want sustainable uh, Web3 game economies. But what really does it take to create a sustainable game economy? That's what we're going to focus on today. And we're going to go through some fairly high level economic um, foundation to help us prepare our games so that our economies will be around for a long period of time and hopefully will always be around uh, for our players. As I said, my name is Matthew. I'm an evangelist. I've been kicking around in the games industry for many years, um, but I've probably now worked on. Uh, I don't know, probably close to 30 or 40 different Web3 game economies, uh, kind of looking at what, what makes it something sustainable and what are the kind of the key things to avoid in the economy design so that we can make sure that we've got um, a nice solid foundation for our players. Haven't just been doing this alone. We've got a number of game designers and quite a large team at Machinations that have been focused on this. We've also been working with Professor Edward Castronova. If you haven't come across him before, I'd highly recommend. He's got a number of books. His most recent one, uh, Wildcat Currency, I'd thoroughly recommend as a way to kind of understand virtual economies. But we've been, Ed, Edward's been working with us to kind of help build out these core pillars. Now, I always like to kick off with a quote. Uh, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I think that's one of the key things that we often see with machinations as well. But also there's a, some, another, another kind of thing that we see people going through all the time when they kind of start to pick up the machinations language, start to pick it up as a tool, which is people tend to go through four stages of kind of learning game design using an abstract platform like machinations. The first one is um, you start to be able to build up uh, your knowledge, you start to understand how the different objects in machinations work. Once you've done that, you start to build out some simple models in machinations, uh, maybe some simple mechanics. Then when you get really good, you can start building these huge, crazy models, which really simulate very complex economies and gameplay mechanics and tokenomics, all inside machinations with a giant model like this. The next step is once you've reached that point, you can then go into this next stage, which is where you understand the economies of these systems so well, you can actually build them in just a few objects that really just kind of gets you down to the very core of how these economies come together. So today, hopefully, rather than going through any of these very large complex simulations or complex models, we're gonna try and keep it fairly simple and keep it these very simple models that hopefully cut to the very core of what we're gonna be talking about. So the core pillars of sustainable economies. 
we've broken this down into three key pillars. And I'm going to go through each of these in detail, but just to give you a quick introduction to them, they really fall into three key categories. The first one is currency stability. The second one is price rationality. And the third one is then proper allocation. And these are the three pillars that we're going to be going through and talking about today. And we're going to kick off by doing a deeper dive into currency stability. So tokens, uh, coins, whatever you want to call it, they're a form of currency. Now, currency has actually been around for a really long time. Uh, money was being kind of created and traded all the way back in kind of 3000 BC. In fact, there's evidence of monkeys using different items as currency within their little communities. E paper money even goes all the way back like over 1500 years. So there isn't anything massively new about currency, it's something we've been dealing with in the, on, on the planet for a huge amount of time. But there's three things that every currency needs to create some type of currency stability. And it needs to have all three of these to be sustainable. The first one is a medium of exchange. It's got to be a way of taking that uh, currency, that token, whatever it would be, and exchange this for something else. And obviously, we see that all the time in games. So, you know, as an example, uh, you know, in Fallout, we're using uh, caps as a uh, form of currency or well, why not if you know we take our dollar bills the only reason those dollar bills have value is because other people say they have value if we were to suddenly replace all dollar bills with coin uh, caps well then they've got value as well if somebody else is going to say they have value and if that all comes down to having a way in which we can transfer these for other items or other goods got to have a way of being able to measure the value or measure what how many we have so it's no good just if you know coin caps were our measurement of account if we didn't have any way of keeping track of how many we had or how many how much uh, they were going to be worth they're no good as a currency we've got to have a way of being able to track and measure this at all times and the third one there's got to be a way of kind of storing value in that currency now, for a currency to have sustainability, if I were to receive some of that currency, I want to better have the confidence that in the future I can take that currency and I can use it to exchange it for a good or service. And it's the same thing with our tokens that we have in any of our Web3 games. We've got to be able to know that if we get some of that token now, we're going to be able to use it again in the future. So those are the three things you must have in your currency to start creating um, sustainability. There are unfortunately a number of things that can cause us instability. The first one is that kind of rapid gain or losses. So really showing signs of either going straight up or straight down. Now, a lot of people think that currency is going straight up and increasing in value rapidly is a good thing. Actually, from an economic standpoint, and there's some negative factors that we're going to talk about in a moment of the, that kind of rapid gains in in our kind of token values or in our economy. Obviously, for it to maintain sustainability, it's got to be used, it's got to be traded, and it has to have a purpose, and people must be using it for it to maintain sustainability, and it, for it not to suddenly stop dropping out of use and nobody is using it anymore. The third one is obviously for a currency to be sustainable, it's got to have some value. And if it does drop all the way down, it's going to be very, very tough for it to suddenly um, maintain sustainability if it doesn't have any value and it's got no kind of utility. Just So just one of those three instability factors could destroy our overall economy. So... It's very good talking about that in the kind of abstract, but let's just try and put some context around it and try and try and talk, walk through a couple of examples of how this can work. So one of these is um, blocking players from investing. So can, these kind of rapid rises and falls can really start to cause um, concern for players. They'll get worried about if it's going to be a safe place. If they were to buy into the economy, what could happen with it? Uh, Gaia Online is obviously the 
they had a present a big issue with kind of gold generators. The gold in the economy started to become, go into hyperinflation. So items rapidly went up in cost. And it kind of led to you know the value of the gold in the game which is completely being destroyed. I used to play a huge amount of uh, EVE Online, an amazing game. But one of the things that we saw a lot of in EVE Online is everyone was very aware of inflation. And it really, if you had any uh, currency, so if you had ISK in the, in the game economy, there was always a demand of like, you wouldn't want to store a large amount of it because inflation was going to mean that if you if you just held the currency, it was going to drop in value because everything was always going to be going up in price. So it drove a behavior that if you had any money, you'd quickly want to spend it um, rather than kind of holding on to it for a larger purchase. You'd buy something quickly so that you could store that the store the value that you had in the game in items and assets rather than in just the currency. And then actually, it's kind of the opposite in terms of New World's economy, um, where actually the gold was so deflationary and the value of gold was going so high that actually players started trying to avoid doing any trading in gold. And actually, it was better for them to do bartering outside of the marketplaces and outside of the kind of gold economy to try and uh, trade items. So it encouraged players to hoard the, um, the gold in the game rather than spending it because it was in such high demand and there's kind of a number of uh, other examples of that so diablo 2 the gold actually became so abundant in the early diablo 2 the players abandoned it as a way of trading altogether and actually started using the uh the stone of jordan as a way of kind of bartering value inside the game so abandoned the actual gold currency inside the game and started using the, the Stone of Jordan as a way of trading. Eventually, this kind of got um, updated and a patch kind of went out. But, you know, players just switched from trading the Stone of Jordan to other things to keep away from the gold currency that was uh, so badly inflated. And actually, as game designers and game developers, quite often we're going to have investors that are going to be coming in and supporting us in the production of our game and this is where you know investors typically are looking for a, a nice stable growth in our economy and in our token values or in our asset values they're not really looking for a, a boom and bust and one of the kind of the key reasons for this is um we all heard this phrase like if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck it's a duck well, here's an update to that phrase, which is if it looks like a bubble and it sounds like a bubble, it's going to be treated like a bubble. And this is something we see kind of time and time again, especially in Web3, where if an economy looks like it's going to be inflationary and if it looks like it's going to go through a boom and bust cycle, that's actually how it's going to get bit, get treated. So the second the game economy starts to look this way, you know, sudden rises in the token value. This will herd in speculators into the currency who are then looking to kind of drive that price up so that they can then sell it for a quick profit. And unfortunately, this can often lead to kind of runaway economies that drive the token value up very quickly. But then unfortunately, at some point, they all start leaving and you get that bursting of the bubble and the token value is dropping down very rapidly. So that phrase of, if it looks like a bubble and it sounds like a bubble, it's going to be treated like a bubble. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that our economies, uh, you know, we want a nice gradual increase, but we don't want that rapid rise because that's just as dangerous as a rapid drop. So inflation, um, you know, we often talk about inflation. Certainly I'm in the UK. We're talking about inflation every day at the moment with the house of price cost of living increasing all the time due to inflation so what i thought i'd do is just share a quick model just a kind of very simplified view of how inflation can kind of impact real world economies and here what i've got is i've just got a couple of objects i've got my treasury so this is my government this is how much of the currency we've got kind of got going around in circulation and my treasury is going to receive some tax each step 
So if I play one step, my treasury is going to pay out an amount of money and it's going to collect some taxes that go back into the treasury. Happy days. It's all going well. Do one more step and we'll notice actually our treasury is overspending. We don't have enough money in our treasury, so we can't afford all the bills we need to pay in, in the following month. But it's OK. We're a government. So what we can just do, we can just print money. So we're going to look at how much extra money we need to print to pay off our bills. Everything's going to be fine. One more step. Um, that's great. We've managed to pay off our bills that month. But what we've done now is we've increased the amount of money in circulation. And as that money in circulation is tied to the value of gold in our in our vaults, each coin or each note that we've got going around in circulations is now worth a little bit less. But it's all right because we're a government and we can just print money. So we'll just carry on printing money. And uh, one of the things we can immediately spot in this situation is this is where we're going to get hyperinflation, rapid runaway inflation. And our economy is going to go more and more exponential where we need to print more and more each money each month to try and counteract this. This is a, obviously it looks like a super exaggerated example. And in many ways it is. Unfortunately, in the real world, we've seen this happen. And I think there's been examples in the world where if you were to drink a cup of coffee, by the time you drunk that cup of coffee, the price of it had doubled. Uh, you know, people uh, claiming where they would pick up a loaf of bread off the shelf, walk to the till. And by the time they got there, the price had changed. So these things do happen in the real world as well. Now, once we've kind of understood how this happens in the real world, we want to start thinking about how this happens in game economies. Because we see this all the time in game economies. And here's one of the most simplest, most um, simple ways of kind of seeing this in a machinations model. So here we've got uh, awarding some tokens to players. And those players are going to use these inside the game to reinvest do some things with inside the economy and they're going to carry on sending these players into the different drains and by drains i mean a mechanism or a game mechanic that utilizes those tokens to reward the player or maybe even progress them to be able to earn more tokens in the future now, as we go along this is looking really good we've got lots of uh drain that's removing all of those tokens from our economy but we'll go a couple more steps and now what we've reached is the number of tokens that are now being produced in our economy is now much higher than actually we're able to drain so at this point if we were then carry this on if those players don't have any way of spending their tokens and they have excess tokens, well, they're going to do the only sensible thing with those tokens, which is to sell them into the marketplace. And this is where we're now starting to see inflation in, in the game, where there's too many tokens being produced. There's not enough utility or not enough ways of draining those out of the economy. As a result, the players are then flooding the market with these tokens. They're going into our AMMs and our liquidity pools, and the value of our tokens is just going to be carried on dropping down. This is a bad thing. We want to make sure we avoid that. Nope, this one. So those are the kind of the key areas of currency stability and how inflation can kind of impact them. Up next is our second pillar. We're going to talk about price rationality. And price rationality the first pillar is all about the kind of overall economy and the overall um, value of our token or of our goods. The price rationality is all about looking at the individual prices inside those economies. Now, this might sound super obvious, but if if a, a item inside the game is supposed to be quite valuable, its price should be quite high as well. So that diamond sword that takes a long time to get inside Minecraft that should be worth a lot more than something that's very worthless, very cheap. You know, a, a dirt block in Minecraft, that should be cheap. Our diamond sword should be expensive. Uh, this might sound really obvious, but it's amazing how many games end up with some kind of instability that's driven by mechanics that have meant that their items that should be expensive 
actually turn out quite cheap and those uh, super cheap items end up being quite expensive then there's kind of three a few different ways that um items kind of get traded within web3 games so the first one is kind of real money trading this is where the value of goods is in terms of someone at something outside an outside unit of currency so OpenSea is a great example where items are put into OpenSea and other pe people get to bid on those or purchase those uh, and they get to set their own price of what they're willing to pay either through an auction or a, or a buy it now. Um, barter systems. So these can be really tricky to get right inside a game. This is where the value of a good is exchanged for another one. Now, this could be a fantastic mechanic inside a game for the right sort of style, but it could be really frustrating for a player to have to go through a process of finding somebody that wants their item and, uh, you know, matching up with somebody that's got something that they want to exchange for that item. Um, implicit price. So this is a, a fairly deep economic um, kind of term. This is when there's a, an item inside the game that the player should consider valuable, but it, because it's not exchangeable, it doesn't actually ever have a real world value. A really good example of this would be some kind of soul bound item. So if a player equips an item, then they're not allowed to sell it. We want that player to have uh, a connection to it. We want them to feel that that item that they have is valuable although they've got no mechanism for kind of trading it or going and um, selling it on any of the marketplaces in any way. Another aspect of price rationality, we've looked at kind of bartering and those different mechanisms. The next one is kind of fixed price. Now, one of the most common questions we get asked all the time uh, is around the kind of the starting price. But if you, if you have items that are fixed price, so we see this a lot in kind of NFT drops with initial mints, where the developer's setting that price for the item and it's going to be fixed for all of that volume of items. Now, if you set that too high and all of those items don't sell, that can obviously have a negative impact on your, your future values or your player experiences because they've bought an item which if there's still excess of that item available, that's going to drive the price down and maybe upset those players. If you set it too cheap, you may be missed out on an opportunity to maximize your, your development funds for your game. And obviously this is all about setting the, the starting price and being able to understand where that starting price should be for your items, which often comes down to what's the value that a player is going to get from that item inside the game. But the most common we, we get all the time at Machinations is what should the starting price of my goods or my NFTs be inside the game? And the only real way of being able to do this is by understanding what value that item is going to bring to the player over a period of time. A great example of this is we, we did quite a, a, help, a detailed project with the Citadel. The Citadel have recently had their economy verified by machinations, which is where we've gone through, we've built out some fairly complex models to really, really understand how their economy is designed and to look at how, they, how their economy could play out in the future and look at, based on their game mechanics, their tokenomics, how they're managing the supply and demand of these different items, what could happen with the value of both their token and their NFTs in the future. This enables us to not only uh, understand the, are they at risk of any kind of boom or bust cycles or kind of excess supply or demand of any items, but it also enables us to work back from there to understand where their starting prices should be so that we can get that price rationality to make sure that the starting prices they have for their items are kind of fit with the value of those items long into the future. The third pillar that we then have is around proper allocation. So this is all about the distribution and the collection of funds from an economy. So the allocation function of an economy refers to the way an economic system distributes goods to people. So how are they how are we distributing both our tokens in terms of rewards or our NFTs? 
and a successful economy distributes the right goods to the right people and does it in a way that seems reasonable and fair to everyone involved. And those last two points are really, really important in terms of making it in a way that seems reasonable and fair. So when we're thinking of a game, we really want to be thinking about distributing rewards or prizes or anything else to players that are an equal that's based on their skill, their time and their effort. So somebody that has a lot of skill, puts a lot of time and a lot of effort into really playing our game and maximizing their, their fortunes, uh, we want them to be more rewarded than somebody who just puts in a very small amount of time, isn't very good at it, and doesn't really try to even um, do well. Obviously, quite often we want a way that people can buy progression or jump forward in their uh, progression overall in the game through kind of being able to buy in, buy items, or buy higher level items so that they can progress faster and get to higher levels. Now, there's always a way of kind of balancing this, but you know, we quite often we want to be able to have that ability for those players to be able to get into the game that want to go through that. Um, there's always a kind of balance here. Some cultures are kind of pay to win is absolutely abhorrent. Um, quite often, um, we want to find a way so that those players that do want to be able to get through the content faster and get to the higher or the you know the higher tier battles, the higher tier levels. We want to give them a mechanism so they can do that without um, destroying the balance of the game and making it own, so that only those people that buy into that uh, process are able to succeed. Um, and this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about randomness. So that we all see randomness inside games, code creates and distributes the good the result of a random number generation call. So this is an element of risk, and in, depending on how the games are set up and how the law for the game is set up, this can be a very natural thing to, to take place inside the game. The other part of this kind of randomness is when a player doesn't know how much an item is going to be worth or what it could be worth if they were to sell it on the market. This is a type of risk, but it's also creating uncertainty. So let's just take a quick look at a kind of randomness in a little bit more detail. So for that, we're going to look at a, uh, a loot box system. And this is kind of taken from the Hearthstone pity system. Now, with the Hearthstone pity system, uh, there's a 0.7% chance of every loot box you open receiving a legendary item. Now, that's great, but um, they wanted to have a way so that if somebody got unlucky and they didn't receive a legendary item, well, in their 40th box that they opened without receiving a legendary item, we want to reward them with a legendary item. So every 40 boxes, no matter what, every player is going to get a legendary item. Now, if I were to run this model, I'm going to run this uh, just the once and see what happens. So in here, I've got all that, that pity logic baked into this. So I've just opened up 40 packs. And actually, my player got really, really lucky. They opened their very first legendary after just four packs. And actually, by the end of the 40th packs, they received five legendary items. This is a really lucky player. Um, so our, leg our loot box system is absolutely fine. In fact, it rewards loads of legendary items. Well, that's not how randomness works. So I'm going to rerun my model, and this time the second player uh, shows me in my minimum now, but my second player, they didn't receive a legendary item until step 27, but by the end of this, they re had received two. Now, after just two um, simulations of opening 40 boxes, I really still don't understand what these odds and what's going to actually happen at volume. So this time, rather than just doing one, player going through and open, opening 40 boxes. I'm going to do 10 players opening 40 boxes and really start to build up a bit more data now on how these players are likely to progress overall. And here I'm looking at my, uh, both my the green line here is tracking how many legendary items they found. The red line here is what percentage of players have received at least one legendary item. 
So I've still got a lot of steps in this, but overall, my um, I've got some players that are only receiving one. Uh, I've got a mean average of 2.75, but I've got a median average of three. But that's only after about 12 runs. So I really want to understand this properly. So I'm going to run 100 simulations and I'm going to open 4,000 boxes just to be able to understand actually after this many simulations, how many, how many drops of people likely to start getting. And as I run this, I often call this like the wiggling uh, lines. So every simulation is updating the average. And it's only really after we've started to see several hundred simulations that those average lines start to level out. We can really be confident that the number of simulations that we've run is accurate and is giving us real data about how, um, how many items players are likely to receive. And this is really important for us to be able to understand as game designers that when we drop in a 0.7% drop rate into a spreadsheet, that's going to tell us that, you know, a certain percentage of players are going to receive a legendary item. In this sort of process, we can really start to build up granular data over the entire that entire experience and what that's likely to look like. So now we can start to really see data on how many drops how many um, players are going to be taking advantage of that pity system and what the overall progression looks like. Now, one of the reasons that this looks like a slightly curved line is that as well as having a pity system for the legendary, you also have a pity system for the um, epic items as well. So it means that as we progress, there's actually a smaller and smaller chance of receiving a legendary item. And that sort of insight is very difficult to get from a spreadsheet, whereas it's very simple to get out of a graph like this. So let's talk about fairness. Um, you know, proper allocation is one of those things where, as I said earlier, it really does come down to, to happiness. In fact, there's been a lot of examples of where people's perception of allocation or distribution of wealth has had huge impacts on the world. You know, the Boston Tea Party is a great example of this, where um, you know, it was kicked off because of a, a tax law impacting the way in which wealth was going to be allocated in, in America. This kicked off the entire revolution as the spark that kind of started the Civil War. So, We've kind of looked at this in terms of kind of player skill. What often proper allocation comes down to is making sure that each of our players is given the quality of opportunity and a quality of rewards. We don't want any one of them to be receiving um, a different, having a different sort of player experience or a different set of challenges. Um, the challenge of this is that if it's absolutely perfectly fair without a little bit of randomness, it can get quite boring. So that little bit of randomness sprinkled in there uh, really does help make a, uh, a deep and interesting game. Uh, and as I mentioned, we would kind of I touched on this earlier, but that kind of play to win approach where the inequalities of real world inevitably influence the distribution of goods in virtual worlds. And making sure we've got that right balance where the people that do want to invest and progress faster can do, but players that are happy to kind of grind through the content or, you know, wait till they receive the rewards, we want it to still have that, that balance of fairness in there. So we've been talking about today a lot of the different things that are kind of similar between real world and virtual economies. There are quite a few things that really make very fundamental differences between what happens in the real world and what happens online. The first one is goods and anything that we have um, in the real world. You know, my amazing T-shirt here, all branded and everything. Uh, this is uh, it took real world resources for it to be produced, whereas a digital item. Um, although there's going to be some artwork, some effort that's obviously gone in to create these amazing uh, assets, once they, they reach that point, they are effectively free to produce and free to distribute. So, you know, I had to pay a shipping charge for my lovely T-shirt uh, and it had to have taxes and transportation costs and everything else impacting the, the value of it. 
whereas in real in three word well, three economies it's borderless almost instant transactions without the need for any of this additional logistical costs one of the most fundamental differences are that eventually my t-shirt here is going to wear out and it's going to be useless at some point and i'll recycle it into rags or something else uh, so nature always burns most assets and decay is innate in all of the systems that we have inside the real world whereas web3 economies the blockchain is permanent so that uh, item that you've created on the blockchain that nft that you've given out as an item inside your game economy that's going to be permanent and that's going to be around forever potentially so without that kind of innate decay it means that every asset that we producing on the blockchain it's going to be there forever so it, we need to think of other ways or other mechanisms that we can withdraw that value from our economies in the real world because of that innate decay governments don't need to be thinking about how to destroy assets governments just need to be thinking about how they can control the supply of money uh, without actually having to worry about destroying it whereas in our web3 economies we need to carefully design ways that we can burn assets and balance that supply and demand of assets into our economies. In the real world, economies never truly drop to zero because you know we're still living here, we still need something to wear, and people still need housing and food and everything else. In Web3, unfortunately, the same can't be said. So it is possible for Web3 economies to drop all the way down. So those are our three pillars that we've been developing. We're probably going to carry on iterating on these. We're right at the start of the Web3 revolution. And I'm certain it's going to be around for a long time. And over a period of time, we're going to carry on building and refining the best practices and, the, and, and what makes up these core pillars. So we kind of looked at what's making a currency stability, what that price rationality is to make sure we're valuing our items and making sure we're controlling the value of our items in the right way. And then we've looked at proper allocation to look at how we can re both reward players or maybe even tax players in some mechanism that feels fair and feels safe for everybody to be using. Now that we've understood our core pillars, what are the best practices we've developed so far to get there? So the first one, is a fact is a statement that can be proven true or false an opinion is an expression of a person's feeling that cannot be proven and uh, i'm always super wary just to make sure that be very very careful of really nice people offering opinions there are a huge number of people that will explain to you how they think your economy should be built how you they think you know you should have a two token system because that's how axie have done it what we want we don't want opinions we want facts and everything that we do at machinations is is about taking opinions out of the game design process we want opinions on what's going to be the best color that's a great thing to have an opinion of when it comes to your economy we want that to be based on facts and we want to be, be able to have a way that we can test our economy thoroughly before it goes into production and we want to be able to destruction test everything rather than making assumptions or doing anything that's based on an opinion so we our first best practice is really to fully test your economy before it's launched so that you can make sure that you understand what could happen with your economy in the future it's not about trying to have a crystal ball about everything that could potentially happen it's more about understanding how you're going to how you're going to react or what you're going to do to if certain events were to happen if you were to get a small number of players, a massive surge of players, if you're pegged to Ethereum and that 10x is hopefully, or if it's a suddenly crash, what impact would this have on your economy? More importantly, what are those levers that you've got in your economy and how would you control them? So understanding all those different points in your economy that you can control and what impact would be when you were to adjust those. If you were to increase the rewards, what would that do? If you were to decrease them, what would that do? And most importantly, if you start getting into a point where you have, you know, you can see on day to day your economy being impacted by runaway inflation, it's almost too late to start doing anything about it. 
you've got to make some really big changes to wrestle your economy back into control you need to have a way of proactively monitoring your economy so it's not about just knowing where your economy is at today in fact some of those moments where your economy might be the healthiest it ever looks on paper in terms of your token prices shooting up those are one of the warning signs where actually you should be most concerned and looking at what you can do to ensure you have a sustainable long-term economy rather than shooting up and then hitting that inevitable crash that comes after such a big rise. And just a, kind of a few things that I think uh, just to kind of part on today. So we've kind of been talking about happiness and fairness. One of the most important things that drives any economy is the happiness of people inside the community that are using that uh, economy. With games, often this means all about fun. And if players are having fun and they're enjoying your game and they're enjoying your content, they'll play more, they'll buy into it, and they will help create a more sustainable economy. And ultimately, this means that you're you're um, respecting the trust that they're giving you in playing your game and if they trust you and they're having fun that's going to drive um, a sustainable economy more than anything else um we're machinations uh if you haven't heard of us please do check out our website it's a free tool to jump in and start playing around with your economies and we produce a lot of content to help people get their economies ready for launch and also test out how their game balance and how their game design works and you know sales plug here come and check it out um love to open up the floor now if anybody has any questions i didn't quite keep track of how long i've been speaking for but hopefully i'm about on time uh so if anybody has any questions please do drop them into the chat and i'll just leave this up on the screen it's kind of one important message uh, as a cheat sheet that if you can control the rate of accumulation of assets in your economy and if you can control the rate of destruction of assets in your economy those are the two most important levers to have on your economy so if you can make sure that any game you're building for the web 3 is going to have that economy has got those two levers you're going to be in a great position uh so please do, if anybody has any questions, uh, please do drop them into the chat. Uh, otherwise, please do come and check us out at machinations.io. So Matt, uh, I'm not sure if you're able to view it, but at the bottom it says, ask a question. So we do have one question. Oh. It says, do you find that the fundamentals are the same as Web3, as non-Web3 economics? And have you had to adjust your views? Well, that's a brilliant question. I think um, there's a kind of a couple of big differences between kind of Web3 games and Web2 games. When the vast majority of Web2 games, even multiplayer games, individual player progression systems are still isolated. Uh, if we're all playing Apex Legends, because it's a brilliant game, uh, if I were to have a great match and I were to unlock a new skin or a new emote or something inside the game, that's not going to impact anybody else's economy. In the world of Web3, I might then win that new emote, win that new skin, and I might go into the marketplace and then sell that item. So suddenly somebody else can purchase that and somebody else can take advantage of it. So Web3, I think the biggest difference between the two is how interconnected all the players are now. And I think understanding that kind of core difference that suddenly um, in the world of Web2, the game designers and the game economy designers are the gods of that universe and they are the gods of that world. They have the ability to kind of really set how a player is going to experience the content, when those new items are going to be released, when they're going to, players are going to have the ability to get to those more powerful items or weapons or areas of the map or whatever it is. Now in Web3, through blockchain mechanics, players have got those abilities to kind of sell, buy and sell items as and when they want to really so our game designer gods have suddenly become maybe demigods, 
but where they you know a lot of the control has now gone back to players to be able to um, influence how they want to experience the game or how they want to progress through the game so it, it really is um, a, a fairly fundamental difference between the two some of the games we've been talking about today uh you know they are effectively blockchain web3 game economies but without the blockchain element to them so you know New World, EVE Online, Diablo, some of these economies are you know, single instance economies where players have got this ability to trade inside the game, but they're not Web3. So I think there's a lot of teams out there that have been doing this for a while, uh, but just not under the umbrella of Web3. But I think for the vast majority of developers that are making this transition from Web2 to Web3, there really is that big mindset change of you know their players are going to have a lot more control over the economy than than they are in a traditional game that's a great question thank you yeah that was wonderful thank you matt um let's see i'll go ahead and mark that as being done i don't see any other questions at the moment so um now for those of you who are oh wait i just saw another one up here hold on do you offer professional services to help analyze games for teams who cannot do it themselves absolutely yeah so um machinations actually been working with a number of different teams um i realize i'm still sharing my screen so yes these are the teams that we're kind of going through this process with and as part of this process we then kind of we've created the new verified by machination seal of approval so you'll see some of these games they have this verified by machinations this is where the machinations teams have worked with these projects we've built out these simulations inside machinations we've tested their economies uh, we've tested them against our core pillars to see whether or not they do have sustainable game economies. So if you're looking for a game to play or looking for some great examples of economies, come and check out our Web3 page, at the, the teams that are going through this very rigorous process with machinations to make sure their economies are set up correctly. Thanks, Eric, for that question. I forgot to talk about all of that altogether. Wonderful, Matt. Well, just so everyone in the audience knows, um, Matt's video will be available after this. So you guys can come back and watch if you want to see it again, or if you guys missed any of it. We do want to thank you, Matt, so much for joining us. Um, this was an amazing, amazing presentation. Super, super interesting how you tied in the real world with the Web3 world. So thank you again for doing this. It's an absolute pleasure. It was great to be here. I hope everybody really enjoys uh, the, the jam and enjoys the, the rest of the talks for today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to try to transition as smoothly as possible. And uh, let's see, Matt, we will... Let's see. Okay, that went great. Now I'm going to share my screen. Um... Hold on guys, just bear with me, that way I